will tell you a little about Deborah Rocha. Deborah Rocha is from Newton area and a singer-songwriter who also works as a professor of interpretation of Portuguese at VU. She's from Kansas. She took a detour for seven years to live in Brazil. That was her place of residence after marrying her husband, Gio, and then moved uh, back to the US and settled in New England. Uh, Deborah studied music in college, but she realized her heart was longing to study art. The artist in her remained uh, after her major of art and getting uh, busy with family. Uh, and uh, when the children left home years later, after the empty nest period, Deborah noted uh, she wasted no time and took over a bedroom, and she began to be inspired to make uh, fiber art of artistic quilts. And these quilts, uh, from my observation and reports of others, uh, are stunning pictures and landscapes they offer humorous perspectives on life as well as images calling for justice and activism in the world. And this is the same with her songs as a songwriter. Uh, at around the same time, uh, Deborah returned to writing and uh, songs and bringing them out to open mics. And her music in uh, performing Brazilian covers, but also her original music, has been inspired by American songbook music from the period of the 1920s to 50s. Uh, she's inspired by Br Brazilian music. Uh, she writes funny and somber songs about life and human behavior, uh, about uh, dachshunds and love and loss and being lost in space and science matters like particles, pendulums, microbiomes, transmogrification, and such. <laughs> and she has recorded two CDs, which we have in the back today, uh, Breeze and Particles. And she's here to share some of her songs with you today and some of her wisdom on her creative process as well. Please give a warm welcome to Deborah Rocha. <laughs> are you, where are you? So, um, y'all remember Leona Helmsley, right? <laughs> well, when I heard her say, only little people pay taxes, I said, lady, you deserve a song. <laughs> to feel it as it slides along my tongue I love to bite it feel it pop up on my teeth it is such fun how I love my caviar I love to sniff it that pleasant essence of the sea I love to squeeze it like an explosion of the ocean on my tongue how I love my caviar. I take it served. I take it straight with toast and tea when I awaken at four o'clock with my martini stirred, not shaken. But the hour you can feel the wondrous power of the stuff is after sundown when the world is just beginning to wake up and frozen vodka plays the tune while fish eggs dance. Oh yes, they waltz upon my palate, do a jig between my teeth as I consign them to the brine from whence they came. How I love my caviar. I won't deny it. I feel a joy beyond delight whene'er I see it. This version of potential sturgeon on my plate. How I love my caviar. I 
take it served with preserved lemon and fine sherry. And chef has concocted dishes extraordinary. Novelle cuisine pairs it with pickled partridge tongue and chopped up chive. The cheese of mountain goat with caviar will excite your appetite with spiny lobster and jellied grouse, a savory snack. I buy direct, and my Belarusian dealer sends it fresh in icy cases that await me at my door. How I love my caviar. I give it out in return for favors from the neighbors who are sweet. The bankers, brokers, judges, and elected bores. How they love my caviar. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Well, um, have you all heard of Edward Gorey? Oh, good. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the converted here. So they had a, a, an exhibition of Edward Gorey's work at the Athenaeum quite a few years ago. And I, I really, really like Edward Gorey's work. And I've never been to the Athenaeum, and I was dying to see the Athenaeum. And I thought, I thought it was like a private institution or something. And it really isn't. It's open to the public. And I thought, with the exhibition there, well, surely they let the public in. So I went, and I explored the Athenaeum top to bottom. And it's a very, very cool building. And I saw Edward Gorey's work. And one of my favorite things there was this case. And on this end of the case was a cocktail napkin with just a, a very rough sketch. And next to that was an envelope the back of an envelope, where that same sketch had been refined just a little bit, and then a piece of typing paper, more refinement, and then it graduated to real drawing paper, and then inked in, and then inked in with details, and then inked in and painted. So you saw the process from this <clears throat> sketchy idea to the finished product. And I just, I studied that case for the longest time because I love the process that people go to, what inspires them, and how that inspiration turns into something. When I, when I have my own inspirations from my muses, I call them my muses, and I picture them as, you know, the three dancing, na practically naked graces that dance up in the sky. Those are my muses. That's who I picture. But I swear that sometimes when I'm working on a song or a quilt, um, I get stuck on something and I'll, I'll say, okay, help me out here. Come on, you girls can do it. And maybe the next day, the answer will be in my head, magically. I feel like I'm channeling sometimes when I'm working. Um, so I left the Athenaeum and I was crossing Boston Common and I said, oh, I just have to write a song, Edward Gorey-esque. So, I hope this fits. For those of you addicted to that black and bracing brew, the ritual must be observed, so whatever you do. If you've important matters to attend to when you waken, First, you must imbibe your morning coffee. Agnes stubbed her toe upon the table in the hall, and hopping up and down, she cursed the karma of it all. She leaned against the cellar door whose ancient hinge gave way, and bump de bump went Agnes down the stairway. Old Arthur could not find his glasses nor his soaking teeth. His fingertips upon the nightstand felt nothing beneath but the old and wrinkled doily upon which his things had rested. Crestfallen, he got down upon his haunches. Poor Agnes. 
place in the cellar and Arthur down on all fours, each wondering where the other had gone off to. Such a pickle, a dilemma that need never have occurred if first they had imbibed their morning coffee. Now Agnes had some strong opinions upon many topics, like how elderly eyes require a pair of spotless optics, and dentures left to soak in cloudy water made her cringe. So she'd taken matters into her own hands. Old Arthur thought he'd heard commotion on the cellar stair, but he was busy locating the items he must wear. And loath to listen, crawling carefully, he searched the floor, feeling for his eyes and for his choppers. Poor Agnes in the cellar and Arthur down on all fours, each wondering where the other had gone off to. Such a pickle, a dilemma that need never have occurred If first they had imbibed their morning coffee Old Arthur, concentrating on finding his small prostheses Resolved he would never give up despite his aching weak knees And crawling there along the wall he finally reached the door where turning round he resumed his vain prospecting while Agnes, broken on the cellar floor, began to swell and breathing in such tiny gasps she could not raise a yell so fondly did she hold the items lightly in her hands in the left his specks, in the right his molars you addicts know good judgment lies within a steaming cup. It sets the gears to grinding till the synapses link up. I'm sad to say that Agnes, agonizing, passed away. Old Arthur, unable to see or chew, lived merely days. But for a cup of java, both their lives could have been saved. If first they had imbibed their morning <laughs> coffee. <laughs> oh. oh, you can't imagine how wonderful it is to hear people laugh at this. Because I'm always afraid that people are going to be kind of, ooh, that's kind of dark. Yeah, it's dark. Not too dark for a Saturday morning, huh? All right. Good. <laughs> um, okay, so I can see that quite a few of you are of my generation, and you might, this next song might recall something to you. And if you young folks don't understand this at all, well, we will hopefully have a few minutes to talk about it at the end. Um, There are eight wads of gum stuck to the bottom of my desk. How do you know, you ask? Well, I can count them. <sighs> After all, what else can you do while waiting for the siren to stop sounding and the all clear bell to ring? Let's have silence, she says, as she strolls among the aisles. And I wonder why the teacher pays no heed. If she does not crawl under the safety of her desk, when the bombs fall, she will be burnt to a crisp. Even though the wads of gum have got my full attention, I am watching from the corner of my eye for the slightest glint of silver to come streaking across the sky so I can say a little prayer before we die. And then suddenly the siren stops its sounding and we hold our breath 
and then begin to squirm till a higher power rings the recess bell to set us free to return to reading about Dick and Jane who get to chase a ball around with Spot the cutest little dog and they run and they jump and they skip and the sky is always blue and the grass is always green but I'll never ever look up in the sky and laugh like Dick and Jane I will always watch for that glint of silver to come whistling the announcement of the end of all life that we have known. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, how many of you hid under your desks from the bombs? You young people, you, you missed out on such an experience. Um, one day I was invited to a gathering of singer-songwriters in southern New Hampshire. Southern New Hampshire is not my stomping ground. Um, but it was the day after Christmas, there was nothing to do, my husband had a game to watch on TV, and I said, well, I'm going. I got in the car and drove off with my trusty map, my wonderful guitar, and my pluck. You know, the day after Christmas, nobody does much of anything. They're just exhausted. They're just so happy it's all over. Um, and I made it up there. I found Route 2. I eat Route 2 is easy. I got off of Route 2 at the proper place, and then I'm going through these back roads in New Hampshire. Um, and I found my host's house. It was a wonderful evening. So many singer-songwriters that I admired deeply, and we all played music for each other, and I listened to their war stories, and it was really, really a, a wonderful evening. But about 11.30, I thought, okay, I got a, probably a two-hour trip, and I walk outside with all my stuff, and I look around, and the snow is falling. I put everything in the car, and my hostess comes out, and she's says, oh, you have to go to Route 2. Well, okay, so you take the third right, and then the fourth left, and then you go for about a half a mile, you'll see the filling station, you take a right there, and then a left, and that'll take you straight to Route 2. Thank you. Not only has she erased my faint memory of how I got there, but everything that she said just went and I thought, this is New England. I grew up in Kansas, where you go far to, see, to get to another town. This is New England. There's a town every 20 minutes. Piece of cake. So I got in the car and started off. And I realized right away that the sticky, very sticky snow was sticking to all of the, of the road signs. There wasn't a road sign for me. But I said, OK, I'm going to do this. This is going to happen. It's good. No problem. So for a while, I tried to find something on the radio, nothing. And the reception was awful. And then I pretended I was Han Solo in his, <laughs> in his spaceship in warp drive. You know, the snowflakes coming down, they gotta go pew. Um, and that lasted for about five minutes. I could entertain myself that way. And finally, I said, my gosh, I have to do something to keep myself awake. Um, I know, I'll write a song. I'm all inspired from these songwriters. Uh, so what can I write a song about? I don't have any songs about dogs. Okay, what rhymes with dogs? And I'm driving. What rhymes with dogs? I don't have a rhyming dictionary. I don't have a, anything in front of me that can help me. So what happens when you do that? You start at the beginning of the alphabet. Okay, dogs, bogs, cogs, fogs, gogs, hogs, through the whole alphabet. Nothing, nothing rang a bell. And then suddenly, boop, clogs. Dogs and clogs because I really like clog dancing for about five minutes. <laughs> clog dancing and what's, what is it? Curling. These are the most amazing things in the entire world for about five minutes. <laughs> the most amazing things about these two, two, two activities is that 
people do them with absolutely straight faces. <laughs> I just, I, I love it. I think it's just a, a, a real, a real um, comment on human nature that we can find such things to entertain ourselves. So, okay, dogs and clogs. And then I hear it in the back seat. <laughs> I said, oh, you're with me. My muses were sitting back there, the three scantily clad ladies. I said, you want me to turn up the heat a little bit? Um, and for the next two hours, until I found Route 2, it took me two hours, um, we wrote three verses, four verses for this song. And when I got on Route 2 and I knew where I was going, I didn't have to entertain myself anymore, and something came on the radio, um, I started repeating the verses to myself because I didn't have anything to write them down with. I hadn't recorded them, and I didn't want to forget anything because I was enjoying this song so much. I got home, and I immediately wrote it all down, collapsed into my bed, and the next day invited the muses to help me finish it. So I hope you all enjoy this song. Dogs and Clogs. It's on the CD in the back called Particle Waltz. Oops. Ah! Bread to do dirty work deep down in holes Picking off hedgehogs and rabbits and voles Harboring deep within their tiny souls A burning desire for the stage Having seen upon the telly one night Such fine lusty dancing a dream did ignite Let's have a toast to the wiener dogs Dancing the jig in their wooden clogs It may seem silly, perhaps even odd To see clog dancing wiener dogs One day she found in the depths of a hole A particularly smelly old mole Hedwina tugged with the strength of her jaw Till she pulled it out into the light Sputtering angrily out of control Between her teeth rides a terrible troll Let's have a toast to the wiener dogs Dancing the jig in their wooden clogs It may seem silly, perhaps even odd To see clog dancing wiener dogs If you let me go, I will grant you one wish. The troll cried, his eyes gleaming all devilish. And that's when Fritz Wiener walked up with a swish, saying, make us 16 pairs of clogs. Clogs, cried the troll in surprise and outrage. Yes, clogs. So that we might dance upon the stage Let's have a toast to the wiener dogs Dancing the jig in their wooden clogs It may seem silly, perhaps even odd To see clog dancing wiener dogs The troll sighed <gasps> Clog dancing's the finest of arts I know all the dances I could teach you the parts. I'll make you the clogs and I'll make them right artful if you grant one humble request. If I cut my hair, take a shower and shave, might I be your manager, agent and slave? Let's have a toast to the wiener dogs dancing the jig in their wooden clogs. It may seem silly, perhaps even odd to see clog dancing wiener dogs. Chink a chink a chink clack clack chink a chink ching ching clack ching ching a chink a ching clack clack ching clack 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 ching 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 a chink a ching clack clack ching 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 clack clack ching a ching clack ching clack clack ching clack clack clack. And now they tour the world shore to shore, eight dancing dogs and their solicitor. If you've not yet seen them, well I must implore that you catch the act when they're in town. 
You doubt there is such a cour de ballet? Well, then why do you lift up your voice when I say let's have a toast to the wiener dogs dancing the jig in their wooden clogs? It may seem silly, perhaps even odd to see clog dancing wiener dogs. Chink a ching, 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 clack, clack, ching, clack, clack, clack. <laughs> Silently the polished orb goes sailing unaware Tethered only to the wire that holds it in midair Back and forth it traces rhythmic ellipses through space Eventually returning to its starting place The pendulum is constant Moving to and fro Until completing its circular course but tis not the pendant that moves itself along. Caught in Earth's rotation, it reflects the force of nature on the floor. Where, running round in circles, Blissfully so unaware Of the speed at which we all are hurtling through the air Back and forth we trace Our rhythmic ellipses through space Eventually 